In this episode of Detroit Performs, an artist shares his belief that art can make a difference in our community. A photographer talks about her experiences during the 60s and 70s. In a barbershop by day, music lounge by night. It's all ahead on this edition of Detroit Performs. Funding for Detroit Performs is provided by the Michigan Council for Arts and Cultural Affairs and the National Endowment for the Arts, and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. Hello and welcome to Detroit Performs. I'm your host, DJ Oliver. This episode brings me to MASH Detroit, located on Detroit's Lower East Side. MASH is a mixed-use space filled with curated retail, pop-ups, community events, and of course, art exhibitions. I'm gonna head inside to see what's shaking at the MASH while you check out our first artist. Brandon Christopher is the creator of Canvas Detroit, an organization bringing arts to men, women, young and old, all around the Detroit area. Art is not so dissimilar from food. Everybody can kind of come together over food. We all have to eat. And while people on the surface might not say that we all have to consume art or enjoy art, it is something for sure that we can all come together and enjoy and, uh, and fellowship. Canvas Detroit is an arts engagement platform. We have all of these different moving parts that are designed to engage people artistically and creatively. So inside of this engagement platform, we do arts classes, and that goes from young to old. We do themed classes. We do corporate and nonprofit art workshops where we actually teach leadership development and team building, but we use art as the, uh, as the catalyst, as the vehicle to, uh, to teach those things. Canvas Detroit is in all of our hearts and minds, <laughs> hopefully. But uh, right now, uh, Canvas Detroit is housed in Mash Detroit, which is a 6,000 square foot uh, space we're actually in right now. But it's a community engagement. Canvas Detroit is part of that community engagement. I think art resides within every person. What that means is that from a very young age, we, we don't face the limitations of our creative ability. We, we think of ourselves as, as being limitless in our ability to iterate and bring things together and imagine. And I think that as we get older though, it's not that it dies, but it becomes sort of covered up in things. And so when I say that in each of us there is an artist, what I mean is that art is still residing within you. And what Canvas Detroit is designed to do is really unearth sort of pull those layers of all those things that you've placed upon uh, your creativity, that you've placed upon your inner artistry, and remove them and sort of reintroduce you. Not only do we want to reintroduce people, we want to cultivate that art. So you meet your art once more, but now let's explore it. Let's, let's have a conversation about it. Let's really engage with our creative selves. We're really excited about uh, Boundless Street Art Installation, which uh, allows people to sort of engage in creating graffiti-type street art with the hope that we sort of legitimize street art as a fine art and sort of take it uh, or divorce it from the realm of the criminal, property defacement, all these negatives, negative ideas that are associated with street art. We work uh, to sort of combat those things. So all of those things we do um, under the umbrella of arts engagement and it's open to everyone. There are really no limitations on who can create and uh, we really invite everyone to come and participate. Part of the balance system itself is to give people the opportunity to participate directly in creating street art. So that's piece one. We have community engagement. Piece two is we'll actually be engaging the community in securing property. So they'll have the opportunity to creatively express themselves on a fence that secures the property. And so the idea is that anyone who might want to come and scrap, there's a barrier between them. And it's not just any barrier, it's a barrier that the community has created. And uh, I hope that with uh, Campus Detroit's help and the help of the artists that we work with, we create a really beautiful barrier that no one would want to even destroy. 
That's the premise, is that um, we're using the power of art to sort of change people's minds and change how people feel. Today at Harvest Fest, we'll be uh, putting our Boundless Art installation up and working with all of the kids there to come and contribute their own street art. And another big thing I, I always want to uh, emphasize is that when we do street art, when we do Boundless, and when we do anything at Canvas Detroit, we speak to our artists and we make sure that they understand the importance of being intentional about their work. What is it, what message are you conveying? Is it a positive message? Is it a sincere message? Is it a message that's going to be uplifting? And uh, we especially focus on those things when it comes to Boundless because Boundless is a public facing installation. So when the community drives by or walks by and sees the installation, it's important for us and it's important I think to the community itself that the ideas and the messages and the images are uplifting. In my personal art, I think empowerment is important. I want people to uh, feel like they can make art too that is potent and that is desirable and visually interesting. And I think that sometimes when art becomes very complex, when art becomes very true to life, or, or even when the art you're viewing utilizes, you know, maybe some very difficult techniques, people often sort of distance themselves from that. So in my personal practice, I like to create art that makes people feel like I could create that too. I like to make art that makes people feel close to me as an artist and not like, oh, this guy is a Picasso or he's a Rembrandt or he's a, you know, whomever. Because I think that that can sort of create an unhealthy distance or make people feel alienated um, from the craft itself. So when I work, I try to create on a scale that feels familiar, that is inviting, and that makes people feel like I want to try that too. So my art, I, I do a lot of line work. I keep it very simple. Shapes and lines are very powerful. When we step into the realm of imagination, when you step into the Canvas Detroit zone, um, we encourage you to be imaginative. And so what you see behind us is our imagining of a Detroit transit system. And even going further, when you think of it, this space, MASH, uh, Canvas Detroit as a business, we really want to facilitate the movement of people, the movement of ideas, the exchange that occurs when you do have a transit map. So again, we take very simple shapes and sizes, things that are very uh, accessible, but we create you know, these larger ideas, these visions for the future. You can learn more about Brandon Christopher and Canvas Detroit, as well as all the artists we feature on DetroitPerforms.org. Next up is Kresge eminent artist and photographer Lenny Sinclair, who was a leader in the 1960s and 70s countercultural movement, and a vital documentarian of that movement and more. I've been an observer of the Detroit cultural scene since the 1970s, and Lenny Sinclair's work documenting jazz, rock, and the social changes, the social revolution, that work is simply irreplaceable. And I wanted to sit down with Lenny and talk about what was behind some of these iconic images she created. The MC5. It was definitely staged because we needed new uh, publicity photographs constantly to send out to the press and prospective uh, club owners. So I was the in-house photographer. Literally, we lived together, so I was the in-house photographer for the band. <laughs> and so when they needed a new publicity photograph, we staged them like that. Now the idea of the, of the buttons, whose idea was that? Hmm, I don't, there's only two people still alive that might know, Wayne Kramer and Dennis Thompson, the drummer. And I don't really know, but I think it was my idea to use masking tape and tape them on the chips. Because the myth, they spread the myth that they stuck them in their skin, and people who have seen 
Iggy mutilate himself on stage with glass. They thought the MC5 stuck him in the ocean. No, they weren't that self-mutilating. <laughs> we use tape. <laughs> We have John Coltrane, 1966, Drome Lounge, Detroit. Yeah. Tell me a little bit what was going on this night. I tried to take pictures every night, but it was very dark in there. There was almost no light, one little red light bulb over the stage. So to get any good shots, um, I didn't use a flash. I never used a flash back then, especially in the jazz club. I wouldn't dare have used a flash for John Coltrane, you know. Fela, Fela and Nicola Pucuti, the uh, most famous singer of Africa. In America, still most people don't know who he, who he was. He passed away, uh, I don't really know when, but a while ago, and his fame is getting bigger. He's getting more celebrated all over the world the longer he's dead. <laughs> That's being used uh, in Nigeria. I, I saw maybe two dozen t-shirts with my photo on it and they have it right on the shrine, the African shrine where Fela used to perform a huge dance song. They have it right on top of the building and uh, when I told people, you know, that's my photo, they kind of just about bowed down to me. They love it. <laughs> I was a celebrity. In fact, the daily newspaper had me on the cover of their Sunday supplement, my four-page face of me saying, the woman who shot Fela. <laughs> For me, her art and what she did is not separate from the community at all. You know, so she was at a, you know, whether it was jazz, rock and roll, blues, whatever. She, she did it all. She didn't, she didn't, she didn't say it was for her. It was all music and it sort of belonged to everybody. And that's kind of how she worked. And that's kind of also how she played and how she lived, um, which, was, which was really cool. And it's also how she continues to live. And, and, and you know, she, she connects to in and everybody and she stays true to who she is. That's John Lennon and Yoko Ono performing at the John Sinclair Freedom Rally in Ann Arbor on December 10th, 1971. We had uh, organized a big benefit to get my husband, my ex-husband, John Sinclair, out of jail. He'd been in for two and a half years, and we had filed appeal and appeal and got turned down. Then we decided to have a big concert and the headliner was supposed to be Bob Seger. He uh, was adamant that he wanted to play for John Sinclair. But uh, we picked Chrysler Arena and Ann Arbor, and it was all Michigan bands on the bill, so there was ticket sales were kind of slow. We were thought we were losing our short on this one. And then John Lennon found out about John Sinclair and wrote that song. It ain't fair, John Sinclair. And then when he found out we had a benefit planned in this huge arena, um, he decided to come and headline the benefit. And we didn't raise a ticket price because of the Beatles. No, it was $3.50 a ticket, so it was sold out within hours after the announcement was made. And so they uh, played. Now the interesting part is that this happened Friday night on December 10th, and on Monday morning, December 13th, they let John out of Jackson prison. The coincidence of that happening three days later was such a powerful symbol that John and Yoko uh, were all enthusiastic about doing similar concerts all over the United States. They didn't take any money, they paid for all their own expenses, and they uh, wanted to leave all the money in the community distributed among the welfare rights people and the civil rights and all that. I think the story of the 1960s has been told so frequently, but it really was a maelstrom of politics and culture and essentially young people reinventing a world uh, based on ideas of freedom and liberation and new experiences. And it went everywhere from the idea of uh, what we used to say. We wanted a revolution. We wanted world socialist revolution, and we wanted the age of Aquarius simultaneously. 
And one of the things that always struck me about Lenny, and it's more so in her photographs, is she was calmly in the midst of it, documenting it. And the big word in the 1960s was now, with a big exclamation point. And yet she had an idea that this had to be recorded. And if, if we, and probably the cliche of, of uh, people not getting the credit that they deserve, it really is Lenny Sinclair. I mean, she is uh, underestimated, underappreciated, and all those other under words. And it's just wonderful that she's now getting the recognition that she deserves. Uh, the Berlin Wall, when the wall was poached in on November 9th, 1989, and I was watching TV. I was all by myself in my little room watching TV, and I saw all that commotion at the Berlin Wall. And there was one woman that they focused on, and she looked so much like me. It was like a like an epiphany. That should be me. I should be there. It was partially because of me they built this wall, and it, it, it's up to me to help tear it down. People like you who wanted to be free from, from people that like me, of East like about thirty thousand people per month fled from East Germany to go to the West before they built the wall. And I was one of them, so I helped build the wall. I <laughs> responsible for them having to build a wall to stop the exodus in, in, before the country, you know, emptied out completely. Lenny Sinclair's work has really been about breaking down barriers, about capturing others when they break down barriers, whether it be artists, whether it be jazz musicians, rock musicians, social activists. And think about some of those images. She captures the musician, the artist, right at the moment of the creation when they're really the most free. And I think that's what she's trying to capture and share with us. The body of work is just an incredible gift to the city, to Detroiters, and really to the world. At MASH, Canvas Detroit features the MASH Gallery Series, and I'm here with a local artist, Karima Sorrell. Hi. How are you doing? Good, how are you doing? I'm you? doing good. All right, so Karima, tell us a little bit about how you ended up here at the MASH Detroit. Oh, uh, that's a good question. I'm good <laughs> friends with uh, Brandon and Marlo. Um, I've been here since the start. It's been very exciting to see them create a space for the community, and it just simultaneously culminated with my finishing of a project, this collection of work which we see behind us, so let's talk about that. Well, this body of work is uh, mostly acrylic based. It's acrylic on canvas, acrylic on wood. The collection is called Mammy, Mermaids, and Me, and it's a concept I've been working on for the last, over the last five years. Let's talk about the technique of your art. Uh, well, I learned a technique that requires one hand. I, I put one coat, and then I let that completely dry, and then I'll revisit the painting. I'll do another painting, so to speak, and I'll let it completely dry. Mm -hmm. And then I'll return again and again about seven times. It can be a very lengthy process. Mm -hmm. Some paintings have, you know, took well over a year to complete. That's what I enjoy, is to like sort of build up the colors and the layers in my work. Can you describe some of your favorite pieces behind us? Well, for me, I think the, maybe the most significant piece is a piece called Nosa Senora. Nosa Senora is Our Lady. Um, it's a piece that's based on the patron saint of Brazil. It means a lot to me because she embodies um, the story of Vimanya, who's an African goddess, and there's lots of story about the sea and um, the mother goddess. And it's connected to the larger concept of my work, which is about mother. How do you know when you're done? That's interesting, that's a hard question to answer because time for an artist is, can be malleable. It can be, you would approach a project and it can engage you for a very long time. You don't feel resolved and you stay there working on it. And then other things are just something you need to get out in the moment and um, are resolved. They resolve themselves almost, so time is difficult. So tell us a little bit about what art means to you. Art for me is a means of expressing um, my voice, of sharing my life, mm -hmm. my moment in this world with uh, others. 
um, voicing and sort of trying to capture beauty. I'm really intrigued by, by beauty mm -hmm. and what I see is beautiful and in an urgent way. Mm -hmm. Like what, what are the things, because beauty almost has like a fragility to me. There's um, a passing to all things. Mm -hmm. We're always in change and so art for me it's about capturing that moment and putting it on the canvas for others to, to share with you. So thank you so much for talking to us, Karima. Thank you. Thank you. All right, guys, let's check out some upcoming events happening in and around the D. To discover more events in Greater Detroit, visit ICSITY.com. Barbershop by day, contemporary music venue by night. A hairstylist with vocal and guitar skills transforms a salon into a music lounge. Check it out. By day, we cut hair over here, and by night, we're transforming the barbershop into the barber lounge. We have live music going on. I come from a long line of hairdressers. I thought it was something I would like to try. I tried it out and it just really clicked. I guess it's more hereditary more than anything. It's right in my blood. I think 95% of the people that come in, they just want a little trim around the edges or something like that. But sometimes you have younger kids that come in and they want to be really, really edgy. And that's where the real creativity comes into effect. I try to give people an experience of really enjoying their time while they're here. I guess by default, I, I am maybe a part-time psychologist. I just don't have the degree to go with it, you know? Right. In the last couple of years, I've been very, very focused on reinventing myself as a hairdresser and as a musician, as a songwriter. And now I wanted to open up a place that I could have not just singers, songwriters, bands, spoken word people, I mean, anything that was very expressive, very exciting, and very new. I have never found a place like that. I took it upon myself to do something a little different that I didn't think I'd ever do. Majesty, And one of the most important things to me is that people that are songwriters, people that write or they're doing spoken word, they're actually being heard in a very intimate setting. How do we do this, you might ask me? Well, while the shop is closed, we move a couple of pieces of furniture around, put some rugs down, put the drums where they need to go, where guitars are gonna be set, get the cameras ready, get the sound sounding good, and also get the artist excited about what they're doing. So much to do, not enough time to do it. So much to say, not enough I got the idea when I was down in Nashville, because there were so many really unique places and people were actually listening. They weren't like over talking and, you know, talking to their friends and being loud and stuff like that. I mean, they were really actually listening to these artists play because they really did have something to say. I have been to many, many places in the, in the area and this is where my home is. So why not try to do something very similar to Nashville, but in my own way? Well, when the artist gets the opportunity to come and play here, we're going to record it for them. We're gonna videotape it, and it's also gonna have its own YouTube channel, which I think is really, really exciting. They get the opportunity to see it, and you know, share it with their friends, and get people really excited about what they're doing. The flames rubbing my body like a mother washing a dirty child. Turn around, I heard you say. 
as you help peel the flesh off my bones and wash away this illusion of grandeur. This is special because you get an in-depth look at the artist and you also get the the feeling of where they're coming from when they're doing what they do. You're not going to get that at a club. You're not going to get that anywhere. You're not going to get it at a coffee house. You're going to get it here. And that's what our focus is. And I'm drowning in you. It's been left on sand. Seasons have grown dead. We're going to get the word out through my shop, also through Facebook, and word of mouth. People that I have come in contact with over the years. I think by doing something like this, not does it always make me feel good, it's going to make everybody feel fantastic. That they actually are giving back to what they do. And I'm giving back to them. And that wraps it up for this edition of Detroit Performs. As always, for more arts and culture, head to DetroitPerforms.org, where you'll find featured videos, blogs, and information on upcoming arts events. Also, check us out on Facebook and Twitter. I'd like to thank Mass Detroit for having us out here today. I want you to go to the corner of Mack Avenue and Ashland to have a great experience shopping, creating, and conversing to the people of our community. Until next Tuesday, get out there and show the world how Detroit performs, y'all. I'm DJ Oliver. Thanks for watching, guys. Funding for Detroit Performs is provided by the Michigan Council for Arts and Cultural Affairs and the National Endowment for the Arts and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you.